The actual practice of meditation is very simple. You sit down, you sit still, you sit with your back straight, that helps you to stay awake. You close your eyes lightly. You want to be as relaxed physically as you can. And then silently, interiorly, in your mind and heart, you begin to repeat your word. And as you say the word, you listen to it. You give it your full attention. When you get distracted, which will be about after one second, you return to the word continually as soon as you realize that you stop saying it. And that's the art and the simple art of meditation. Father Lawrence Freeman, a Benedictine monk, is dedicated to the teaching of Christian meditation. This form of prayer, using just a simple word, was passed on to him by his teacher, the late Father John Main, who started the first Christian Meditation Centre in London 25 years ago. Since then, the community has grown significantly, with meditation groups meeting in nearly 50 countries. Father Lawrence has written books on Christian meditation and led spiritual retreats throughout the world. While in Singapore in 1999, he shared his insights with meditator Richard Sia. Father Lawrence, thanks for being here to share your insights on Christian meditation. Let's start with something really basic. What is meditation? Meditation is pure prayer. It's a universal spiritual tradition, a spiritual practice. You find it, of course, in all the great religious traditions of the world. And we find it also at the heart of the Christian tradition of prayer or contemplation, sometimes called the prayer of the heart. It's a prayer that takes us beyond our own thoughts, beyond our own self-fixation and self-centeredness, beyond the mind into the deep center of our being. And it takes us into the prayer of Christ. You speak of meditation as prayer. Whereas in the modern context, meditation is often talked about as a way to relieve stress or even to enhance the power of the mind. Can you comment on this? Meditation certainly does have those side effects, but I think it would be um, underestimating the full meaning and the full power of meditation if we just reduced it to, these, uh, to a technique of uh, stress reduction. I would say what meditation does is uh, something much more than just relax us, it brings us to peace. And peace is the full harmony of the whole person. So meditation is prayer and like relaxation might be just one of the side benefits. So yes. yeah. How is meditation Christian? The way you teach meditation, how is it different from the way meditation is taught in other religions? Well, meditation is Christian. Um, because, first of all, the meditator who meditates in a Christian way is meditating from faith in Christ, a personal faith in the risen Christ. And uh, a Christian who would come to meditation would be meditating in order to deepen their knowledge and personal love of Jesus. And we do this in a Christian tradition, a historical tradition of, of uh, Christian spirituality. Uh, what makes meditation Christian also would be the fact that we meditate in a Christian community, supported by the Christian scriptures and Christian worship. So the context is Christian, but the method is universal. Well, as I said, you find uh, there are various methods of meditation in all the different traditions, and many forms of prayer as well. What we find in the uh, Christian tradition of prayer is a very simple contemplative method which takes us beyond words, beyond thoughts, beyond images into silence, stillness and simplicity. And those three qualities you could say are the, the basic elements of, of contemplation. Silence, which means that we are um, letting go 
of our own thoughts, of our own words, and we are learning to be ourselves. Whatever is truly natural is silent. Stillness means that we are not uh, running after something, we're not trying to get anything, we're, we're learning to be in the present moment. And simplicity means that we are becoming like a little child, as Jesus says we must become if we are to enter the kingdom of heaven. So we're not analyzing our progress, we're not thinking about ourselves, we're not complicating ourselves. So these are the essential elements, I think, of, of contemplation. And you find in the early Christian tradition, in the teachings of the Desert Fathers, the early Christian monks, in John Cassian, in the Middle Ages, in uh, Cloud of Unknowing, you find uh, a very simple method which John Main uh, recognized and re-expressed in modern terms. Who is John Main? What role did he play in promoting Christian meditation? John Main, uh, in the course of his own journey, um, went in search of a contemplative um, experience of prayer. And he had first been introduced many years before he became a monk to meditation in the Eastern tradition. But uh, later, he began to research more seriously uh, than ever before uh, the, the roots of Christian spirituality. And in the teachings of John Cassian, uh, the, in the Desert Fathers, he found a, a very simple method. To take a word, John Cassian calls it in Latin a formula, John Main uh, spoke about it as a word, or as a mantra, a sacred word or a sacred uh, phrase. And then what they recommended was to repeat this word or mantra continually during the whole period of the meditation from the beginning to the end. Letting go of all the other thoughts, the riches of thought and imagination, they said. And John Main was a Benedictine monk uh, at the time that he um, found this tradition and it changed his life, it changed his understanding of what the Christian monastic life was about and he felt that um, he was called to devote the rest of his life to, to teaching this and uh, that's what he did and as a result of his uh, personal discovery and his, his founding of a small community based on this uh, practice of Christian meditation the, a much wider global community came into being since his death. Can you elaborate on this method that John Main taught? You say it involves repeating a prayer word or mantra. What is a mantra and how does a mantra work? The mantra is, a, as I say, simply a word or a short phrase that you would normally choose from your own tradition. So a Christian would ideally choose a word of scripture, for example, perhaps like the name Jesus. The word actually that we recommend is the word Maranatha. Maranatha is an Aramaic uh, prayer. It's the oldest prayer uh, in the Christian tradition. It means the Lord comes or come Lord. Uh, St. Paul ends the first letter to the Corinthians with it. St. John, the book of Revelation. And th so the mantra is a sacred word that expresses your faith and your love. Now, how does it work? It works in the theology of, the, of Christian uh, prayer by bringing us into what Jesus called poverty of spirit. Now poverty of spirit is the first of the Beatitudes. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So poverty of spirit is not a negative state. It's not a state of desolation or a state of, uh, of loss but it's a state of radical detachment, of letting go. And it's in this letting go, not trying to possess, that we actually can enjoy the mystery of God and enter into it. So the mantra brings us to poverty of spirit because it actually unhooks us or detaches us from our own egotism. And the mantra helps to calm the mind, it clears the mind, it enables us to let go of 
uh, the mental activity, the thoughts, the desires, the plans, the anxieties that fill our minds the whole time and keep us always so fixated on ourselves. So the mantra helps us to let go of all of this and to move uh, quietly with grace, with the grace of the Spirit, into the prayer of Christ himself in the heart. To summarize, what you are saying is that when you meditate, all you need to do is say the mantra from beginning to end. Is that it? That is basically the teaching of this tradition. Um, a tradition that we received from the Desert Fathers 1500 years ago. And they themselves said that they received it from the Apostolic Church. Now, meditation is not magic. It's not just a technique that you can turn on and off. It's a way of faith. And it's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual discipline which leads us into an experience of being a disciple who leaves self behind, not just a, a technique to, to get a, a feel-good factor. Um, and of course you meditate in a context, in the context of your, your uh, spiritual life as a whole, your faith, your community. Um, you're nourished by many other forms of prayer. Uh, meditation doesn't uh, exclude other forms of prayer but it, uh, I think, quite the reverse, in fact, for the, um, uh, the Christian who is praying in other ways, I think they will find that meditation enhances the other forms of prayer, like the reading of scripture, worship, the sacraments, the Eucharist. All of these become much more meaningful. What's involved in this discipline of meditation? Well, the discipline of meditation is, um, is, is, uh, is quite demanding. One shouldn't uh, pretend that it's easy. It's simple, but it ain't easy. Um, the discipline is really, first of all, the discipline of saying the mantra faithfully from beginning to end. Now, well, we meditate for about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, the, the ideal time would be about 30 minutes. and. When you're beginning, you might find that's a bit too long, so you could start with 20 and gradually build up. You want to meditate every day, ideally twice a day, uh, in the early morning and in the early evening, before you go to work, and at the end of the day's work, and say in the early evening before you have supper and, or, or go out uh, to the cinema or watch TV or whatever. So obviously today you have to be quite flexible, uh, because of modern lifestyle, but basically these are the two most deeply traditional times of prayer for the human being. And I think uh, one shouldn't be frightened of the word discipline because the word discipline um, indicates something that f sets us free. Um, and we're prepared to accept discipline in lots of areas of our life, such as our study or our uh, work or our emotional life. So we need to uh, understand the importance of a, a daily discipline in our spiritual life as well. You acknowledge that it's not easy. And I think many people react to meditation by saying, I cannot do it, I cannot sit still, I cannot concentrate, I cannot find the time. What advice would you give? Well, I think um, you know, you'll only meditate if you want to meditate. And if you want to meditate, it's probably because you, you feel a need. Something in your life or in yourself, uh, uh, you're looking for a deeper meaning, uh, for peace, for a deeper experience of God, uh, for a greater unity within yourself. You're looking for something deeper. And uh, unfortunately, to go to this depth, we have to make a journey. Uh, we can't just take a pill or uh, we can't just uh, wave a magic wand, we have to practice a discipline. Um, and then I think most people, and this was certainly true for me, uh, begin their journey with a rather bad discipline. And uh, their discipline gets stronger as time goes on. Um, you need the support of other people. You need to, as I say, nourish your understanding of um, what meditation really means. And then, what begins to happen is that you, your own experience begins to teach you. You begin to see, uh, through your own experience, how meditation is changing you, changing your approach to life, 
uh, working some deep changes perhaps in releasing you from fear or anxiety and giving you a greater sense of peace and a sense of the presence of God in situations that are uh, difficult. So I think um, it takes time and, we ha and you have to work at it. So what, what led you to meditation? What, what need did you feel that got you into it? Got you well, that's the first six volumes of my autobiography. <laughs> um, but what led me to meditation when I was in my early twenties um, was the human journey, the human search for meaning and for uh, peace and for uh, for depth. And I was very fortunate to to have known uh, John Maine, and uh, I went and uh, visited him at a particular moment in my life when he himself was also beginning to meditate again and uh, he introduced me to it very gently and very simply. I almost didn't realize what was happening uh, and I remember the, the first time that I started to meditate uh, and I remember thinking this is right, this makes sense, this is something I would like to pursue. But I was at university and then I worked for a few years after university and I found it very difficult to get the, the discipline into my life. But uh, it wasn't, but that initial insight uh, kept, me, kept me going. What were the difficulties that you encountered and how did you overcome them? Well, I think the difficulties uh, I encountered were very much the same difficulties as everybody else. Uh, the difficulty of practicing the same discipline every day, whether you feel like it or not. Um, sometimes, you know, you feel like meditating, you feel very harmonious or you feel very uh, spiritual and uh, it, it, you've got nothing else to do and uh, meditation is very easy. At other times, you, uh, have, you're very busy and you're doing too many things or you feel very turbulent or you're going through a very um, uh, difficult period of your life and it, it seems you don't want to sit still, you don't want to face yourself. So I think it's the same for everybody, particularly today, a question of time. But if you, if you say to yourself, I don't have time to meditate, I would like to, but I don't have time, you should just listen to what you're saying. Because you're saying that you don't have time to be yourself. Because that is essentially what meditation is. And anyone who does practice uh, the, the discipline of meditation, and gives the time to it, uh, will find that their life and their use of time is greatly uh, enriched and uh, you find that you're not losing time, you're gaining time. But that comes after a while, right? Like well, initially, what did you do when you didn't feel like meditating? Well, uh, initially I didn't meditate. <laughs> and eventually I realized that uh, in not meditating, uh, I was missing something, that what I was looking for um, although it was difficult to uh, define it or explain it, but I was finding it through meditation. When I didn't meditate, I knew that something was missing. To what extent do, do the techniques help? Earlier you mentioned, for example, that it's important to sit straight. And some other teachers emphasize breathing techniques, for example. To what extent are these important? Well, I think they're of secondary importance. And it's very important for us uh, not to get caught up in techniques. You know, meditation isn't about mastering a technique or even having to understand something very difficult and theoretical. Meditation is something very simple and very practical. Your posture is important. If you're sitting in a very sort of lazy kind of way, then your mental attitude is going to be affected. So your physical posture should be alert, but relaxed. Sitting with the back straight is a universal basic rule of, uh, of posture. Breathing is uh, important, of course, uh, but in this tradition, with the mantra, we don't focus on the breathing. But many people will say the mantra in conjunction with the breath. For example, they may say the mantra as they breathe in, and breathe out in silence, or say the first two syllables, ma, ra, as they breathe in, and the second two, na, tha, as they breathe out. But these are just suggestions. There's no 
one right way. You have to do what, what feels most comfortable. The important thing is not to divide your attention between the mantra and the breath, because then you're defeating the purpose of meditation, which is to unify your consciousness and to come to a single, simple point of attention. If you think of the breath as a wheel that's constantly turning, you're breathing in, you're breathing out, and you can rest the mantra on the breath and just pay attention to the, to the word, to the sound of the word, that's probably the best, the best advice. How do you deal with distractions? Well, dealing with distractions is the, is the art of arts. In the orthodox tradition of the church, they say um, that the art of arts and the science of sciences is how to deal or master harmful thoughts. So, The Cloud of Unknowing, which is a, a very wonderful little medieval book on meditation in this tradition, says that the way you deal with the distractions is not to try to fight them. Because if you try to fight them, then you will lose and you'll just tire yourself out and you'll feel exhausted and a failure. So don't fight your distractions. You're not trying to blank out the mind. You can't do that. But what you can do is to let go of them. So the, the mind is full of thoughts, plans, desires, anxieties, images, fragments of conversation, uh, full, of, full of activity. Normally, we become engrossed in that. We're sort of flooded with it. But what we learn in meditation is to step aside from that because there is a deeper level of consciousness than all of this mental activity. So what we can do is we can simply withdraw our attention from these thoughts and that's what we do with the mantra. That's why we give all our attention to the mantra. So when you get distracted, Don't feel discouraged. Everybody is distracted. This is part of the journey. Don't, don't try and measure your progress either because you can't see what is happening. And you have to take it on faith that something is changing, something is happening within you, the work of the Spirit, working through your faith, but at a level of your spirit that's deeper than your mind can see. So you just have to take that on faith to begin with. And um, so the basic rule of dealing with distractions is to ignore them, uh, to let them go, uh, to keep returning to the mantra, and not to be discouraged. But that's not easy, right? It's not easy, but uh, it gets a little easier. Uh, like anything else, like riding a bike or um, using chopsticks, uh, you, you get the knack of it uh, after a while. Do you feel anything when you meditate? Yes, you feel different things at different times. At times you may feel very peaceful and very joyful. At other times you may feel very agitated and very restless and feeling that you're making no progress. And basically you have to ignore your feelings, at least um, not be controlled by your feelings. Because what we're doing is entering into an experience, an experience of the spirit that is actually deeper Than any, than any of these kind of emotional states. Feelings come and go. But at that level of our spirit, where we are in union with the mind of Christ and the love of Christ and the peace of Christ and the joy of Christ, that experience remains with us even when our moods may go up and down. If during meditation I feel agitated or I feel lousy, it's all right. It's perfectly all right, yes. In fact, uh, you, you may think that your meditation was a complete waste of time, but uh, in the perspective of the spirit, it may have been a very valuable meditation. You may have processed a lot, you may have been purified of a lot of negative uh, content. In other words, just do it. Just do it, but, but when you just do it, <coughs> if you practice the mantra as a, a way of faith. You say it faithfully, you say it gently, you're not using violence. It's not a, a rigid or a mechanical type of repetition, it's a loving repetition. It's the sort of repetition that we practice uh, when we're doing something faithful. 
uh, and uh, maybe like the repetition of a musician practicing uh, their art or the little repetitive rituals that people in love uh, uh, show to each other. So it's repetition in this organic and faithful sense. And what happens is that at first, when you first begin to meditate, you may be saying the mantra very much in your head, battling with your distractions. But as time goes on and the mantra takes root in your heart, then you come to listen to it. And when you're listening to it, there's always this act of faith because you have to give it your attention. But uh, that's really where your meditation is, 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 is happening. And um, eventually, in God's own time, the mantra may lead you at moments into complete silence. But at that moment, you will not be thinking of yourself. Getting a bit uh, abstract here. Uh. Well, yeah, you, and you don't have to uh, um, worry about uh, defining it because it's not easy to put into words. But you can experience it, and you experience it as a greater sense of uh, unity and peace with oneself. It expresses itself then in a greater harmony with other people. Uh, even people you don't know, when you first meet them, you will be less suspicious or less fearful of them. Uh, you'll see it expressed in your relationships with your children and your spouse or your friends or your colleagues at work. And it will express itself in your sense of relationship to people in society. Uh, your sense of being a, uh, a person who is um, interdependent and responsible or shares a responsibility for the needs and the well-being of others. A sense of relationship to nature, to the environment. So it will be in these ways where we experience our oneness with ourselves, with others and with God that we see and we experience the fruits of meditation. You have painted a very positive picture of how when you meditate you become more harmonious with everyone else. But sometimes people worry that meditation can also be dangerous. Can, is there any danger? Can, can anything ever go wrong when you meditate? Well, I think the, the, the danger is that we don't meditate, that we lose this contemplative spiritual vision of life. And we're beginning to see the very serious consequences in our world of uh, losing that spiritual dimension in our education, in our health care, in our politics, in our family life, uh, in our personal life. So I think um, <laughs> if meditation were dangerous, um, it would be a small danger compared with not meditating. But I don't think there is a danger in meditation, actually. If, if we uh, understand what, what we mean by meditation, and we, we, we learn to meditate within a, a tested and tried wisdom tradition, a spiritual tradition, um, we have great teachers, we have great wisdom in telling us how to do it. If we're moderate, if we're disciplined, and if we are not uh, allowing the ego to, uh, you know, take over our spiritual life, I mean, that's the danger of a kind of a consumer spirituality that you often see today, that uh, spirituality is reduced just to um, getting a certain feeling or experience or developing certain special powers or gifts. That isn't meditation. Some of the fundamentalists uh, Christians uh, sometimes say that meditation is dangerous because you're blanking out your mind or you're opening yourself up to uh, the devil or evil spirits. I think that says more about the fundamentalist psyche than it does about meditation. I think the fundamentalist psyche is a very repressed one and a very fearful one and therefore that's why it often gets so angry. And they quite rightly intuit that when we meditate, we are letting go of those repressions. And so what we have repressed will begin to surface and eventually be released and become conscious. But they think that the devil is coming in, but you could equally well say the devil is coming out. <laughs> so I, I don't think there is a real danger in meditation, provided we, we are rooted in a tradition and we meditate with the wisdom of that tradition. But you, you talked of the danger of 
losing a spiritual perspective of life. But surely meditation is not the only way to keep that spiritual perspective. No, I mean, I don't think one should say meditation is the panacea for all ills or the answer for every problem. Um, and I would simply say that it's very interesting and significant that so many millions of people today around the world are deeply interested in meditation. They want <coughs> to find a depth within themselves that will enable them to live their lives in a more meaningful, a more fully human, a more harmonious and loving way. Why, why do you think this is happening? I think it's happened because we are in such great need today. I think we're, it's happening because the spirit uh, is restoring us to a lost tradition. Uh, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit he would send would remind us of what we had forgotten. And I think that's what's happening today. And I think there is something mysterious happening in the world. Um, a coming together of um, races and religions and cultures uh, into a global unity, a sense of the human family. And I think uh, this unifying of, of the human consciousness as, as a family requires a spiritual dimension. And what we see in meditation is a universal spiritual practice that enables every human being, whatever their religion or race or creed or culture, to enter into an experience of oneness and of friendship. In this case then, what you're emphasizing is a spiritual view of life, but not necessarily within a Catholic or Christian context. No, I think that ideally we do belong to a spiritual family. And um, we've had a long ongoing dialogue with the Dalai Lama for, for a number of years in our community. And I'm always impressed by the clarity of the Dalai Lama when he says that he does not advise people to change their religion. He says you're free to if you like, but he doesn't advise them to. There's a very good reason for that. And also, I think there's a tendency today to, for many people to reject the church as an institution, and it's a very sinful and human institution got many faults, many, many problems. Uh, and many Christians reject the institution um, for these reasons. Uh, but then they find themselves rootless. They find themselves bouncing off a bit of Buddhism, a bit of Hinduism, a bit of Judaism. And they may think that they're coming to a sort of a, an, a universal state, but sometimes they're just in a very confused state as well. I think that uh, the wisdom of the great teachers is be rooted in yourself and to be rooted in yourself you must be rooted in a, in a tradition. If you're really rooted in it then you will transcend the, the egotism of that tradition. Every tradition has its own ego perhaps but if you're deeply rooted in the contemplative dimension of that spiritual tradition you will be able to live with your, its ego, just as you can live with your own ego and see your own faults of character and traits of personality you would rather do without. Um, so you can accept the fact that the church is a human institution. Uh, hopefully it will get better, but it will never be perfect. Uh, but you will be able to see the spiritual and the mystical meaning of the church, and the church as the mystical body of Christ, for example. And I think meditation brings many people back to their, um, to their own tradition with this uh, perspective of, of a, a spiritual understanding of the church. Within the church, the tradition is well, mostly in the Bible, in the Old New Testament. So where in this tradition is meditation uh, talked about or, or mentioned? Well, I suppose you could say that the only actual method of prayer that Jesus taught was the Our Father. The disciples said to him, teach us to pray, and he gave them the Our Father. So I don't think we look at the New Testament for particular uh, 
practical methods, but I think in the context in which Jesus taught as a, a Jew of the first century, uh, in the context of the early Christian communities, um, we can find uh, the way of meditation that, that, that we're teaching and we're talking about. But if you look at, but that method of meditation ought to be entirely compatible with the, with the, with the teaching of Jesus on prayer. And I think it is. For example, if you look at chapter 6 of St. Matthew's Gospel, which begins with his teaching on, on prayer, where he says, for example, don't, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrite uh, who like to see other people, to, like other people to see them praying and so on. <clears throat> but go into your inner room and pray to your Father who is in that secret place. If you look at the essential elements of the teaching of Jesus on prayer, you'll find that they match very, very completely what we're doing in meditation. For example, interiority, going into the inner room of our heart. He says, when you pray, do not go babbling on like the heathen, who think the more they say, the more likely they are to be heard. Your heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask. So in other words, <clears throat> at the time of meditation, we don't have to come to God with our shopping list, with our, all our needs and all our desires. And we don't have to be superstitious about saying many words. We can be brief and we can be trusting. He tells us that we must let go of anxiety about material matters. He's not saying that it's not important to be concerned about what we are to wear and what we are to eat, but he says do not worry about it, don't get over anxious about it. Trust. And then he actually gives us a beautiful idea of how to let go of that anxiety. He says look at the birds of the air or the lilies of the field. In other words, contemplate the beauty of nature, the beauty of creation, and that will relieve you of your your material anxiety. And that's really what we're doing when we meditate. We are contemplating the essential beauty of our own nature. And finally he says, be mindful. Set your mind upon the kingdom before everything else. And everything else will come to you in due course. And he says, be in the present moment. Tomorrow will look after itself. So these are the essential elements that we are practicing when we meditate. And of course he also says, pray without ceasing. Pray always. And we have to understand what he means by that. Because praying without ceasing doesn't mean that we, we go around muttering prayers to ourselves all day. Or it doesn't even mean that we're thinking about God all the time. What it means, I think, is that we open our spirit to the continuous, to the constant prayer of Jesus himself within us. That's why St. Paul says, we do not know how to pray, but the Spirit prays within us. So, this is what meditation does. Those two periods of meditation every day, as it were, sink a well into this great um, continuous prayer of Christ, and more and more fully, that prayer rises up in us, into our minds, our bodies, and our spirits, and fills us and remains with us throughout the day. Who do you say I am? Messiah. Who do you say I am? The Anointed One. Who do you say I am? Messiah. the living God. Son.